God brought me into a vision and I began to see a cologne bottle, you know, like a man's perfume bottle. And it was in a special display box like you would see at a store. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say this so clearly. He said, Hey y'all, this is Troy. So I have a word from the Lord to share with you today about something that's going to be released by a company that has to do with someone making a mockery of Jesus. And a lot of us have seen, if you've watched any of the news, especially the Christian news feeds, we've seen the ways in which the world has kind of gone down this spiral of darkness over the last couple of years, but especially the last couple of decades. And it's something that's always been happening since the beginning of the fall of humankind. You know, there's always been the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life that we have to choose from. And obviously that is a metaphor now, but it was reality when Adam and Eve walked in the garden. And every single day we have a choice to make, you know, and even the church has been tempted to go down a road of knowledge and a road of political correctness and a road of bowing to cancel culture, a road of trying to not offend anyone, trying to appease everybody. And we've seen some weird things happen in the church lately. But this is a specific word that God has given me about something that's coming. And then he also gave me a word of encouragement for today. If you've ever wondered, what is the antidote? How do we fix this? The Lord has given me a word that has to do with this. And I believe that you're going to have the answer today. It's going to be, become so clear. If this is your first time ever watching this channel or maybe one of the first videos you've seen here, I believe that this is the message the Holy Spirit has given me to preach, not just one time, but this is my lifetime message that he's asked me to preach. And I also believe it's the message that he's asked the church to preach. And in many ways, we have failed as a church to preach this message. And that is the reason why the darkness is able to spread, not just outside of the church, but within in many ways. And the answer is coming. But this is what I saw on March 15th. I was spending time with the Lord and God brought me into a vision and I began to see a cologne bottle, you know, like a man's perfume bottle. And it was in a special display box like you would see at a store. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say this so clearly. He said, they are going to make a mockery of my son. So this, this is from the father's perspective. He's saying they're going to make a mockery of my son. And then I heard this is a major retailer who is going to be involved with this like a candy used to trap a young person, they will entice a celebrity into performing for them. And so this has obviously been happening, this idea of compromising values in order to make money, in order to be heard, in order to be liked in the culture today, in order to not be canceled, you know, in order to go along with the ways of the world. But many times people don't even see it as compromising values because they don't have the values to start with because the consciences have already been seared to a great extent. Our culture is no longer a Christian culture, even though it, it technically never was, because being a Christian means you actually know Jesus for yourself. It doesn't mean you go to church. It doesn't mean church is the norm. It means you know him for yourself. You have a personal relationship. So in many ways, the culture was never technically Christian. It just modeled some of the Christian values a little better and stuck closer to some of the biblical values. But what we're seeing now is a complete rejection of that. So not only have we seen the generation that threw off the bounds of Christianity, but now the next generation after that is going a step further. You know, each generation takes it a little further and they're actually mocking it. And then, you know, eventually it's going to lead to the opposite. Instead of Christianity being accepted, it's going to be actively fought against in every way possible. Okay, so this is something that as Christians, we could get very caught up with and we could get distracted by. And the Lord is asking us today very simply, not to get distracted. Man, I hear the Holy Spirit saying, oh, my bride, from Jesus's perspective, oh, my bride, don't let the ways of the world in. And one of the ways that they get into your heart, they seep into your heart, is you don't have to just go along with them in order for them to seep in. One of the ways is that they come in and they distract you from what's right. And my purpose and my calling on your life, don't let them distract you. And I hear the Lord saying, keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes centered right here, right where I'm at, where I come and I meet with you in the quiet place, where you engage with my word in a real way. The seeds are planted and things begin to change where the truth is sown into your heart and you see the fruit of it. And I hear the Lord saying, when you're actively engaged in a pursuit of my word and what I've said to you and the fact that I'm with you, when that's where your heart is set and your eyes don't wander anywhere else, you're going to be basking in the presence of God. You're going to be basking in the peace that I have for you. That's going to become natural. It's going to become not second nature, but first nature. 
This is the nature of Christ, I hear the Lord saying, that I've given you. And it's freedom. This is a walk based on freedom, not based on fear, not based on trying to keep the devil out, but instead based on letting the Holy Spirit fill within and then letting his life burst out of you. And you begin to influence everyone around you in ways that you never thought were possible. I hear the Lord saying, let me do this through you today, my church, but you've got to be filled first. You got to let me fill you. And that only happens when you come in by faith because of my grace. I hear the Father saying, because of what my son has done for you, and you fully embrace it and receive it. And this becomes a daily process of renewing your mind to think along the same lines as my word, to think along the same lines as the promises I've given you, to think like the second chapter of 1 Corinthians says, in line with the thoughts of the Spirit. Man, I hear the Lord saying this so clearly. Do not be afraid to go into this next season that I've called you into. It's going to get rocky. And I just see a roller coaster going up and down. A picture of one of those old wooden roller coasters, you know, like I think it was called the Texas Giant. And they were so rumbly. And the Lord is saying, the rumbling is coming, but it's my spirit within you that gives you the guidance to actually make it through victoriously, to make it to the next season. Not just alive, but fully living, full of life, full of the joy of the Lord. I hear the Lord saying this. He's saying the world doesn't have to get you to act like them. They just have to get you to look at them so that you'll be distracted. But that's not what I have for you. I have a better calling for you. Look at what Jesus did. Keep your eyes centered on him and you're going to be just fine. You're going to be okay no matter what comes this next season. But this is what the Lord said on March 15th. I'm going to read this. It goes right in line with what the Lord is speaking right now. He said, some of my people spend more time looking at how the world mocks the sun than they spend looking at the sun. And he said, look at him and find life today. Stop looking at all the things the world is doing. You focus on me and my work through you. I want to use you to do great things for the kingdom. Don't underestimate what I can do through you if you only allow me to move. I mean, I just feel the confirmation of the Holy Spirit on that word right now. But I want to read a few verses that God pointed me to. This is Numbers 21.9. So what happens is the children of Israel begin to complain. They begin to complain against Moses and against God who brought them out of Egypt. And they begin to talk about how there's no food, there's no water, and how they detest what it is that God has given them to eat, right? What they do have. And, you know, and obviously God had been giving them manna from heaven. You know, and so because of their complaints, serpents or snakes come into the camp and begin to bite the people and the people are dying. So God instructs Moses to build this pole and to put a serpent on it. And so Numbers 21, 9 says, it says, so Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on the flagpole. And it came about that if a serpent bit someone and he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Okay, so the serpent in this case represents Jesus upon the cross taking the curse upon himself. It says that he became a curse for us. So it doesn't represent Satan, but it represents instead the, you know, the serpent was the one who lied to Adam and Eve in the garden and got them to go away from God, the ways of God, right? And every single day you and I have a choice to make. Am I going to listen to the lie? Am I going to listen to, you know, that idea of, well, if I just know more, if I just bite this apple, if I just go down that rabbit hole, if I just go read that post, you know, if I just do this or that, or just find out how evil people are being over here, or if I just listen to this podcast, which exposes everybody in this church or something like that, you know, like those things are not always wrong, but when they become the focus, they lead us away from what the Holy Spirit is calling us to do. So Jesus became the curse for us. And this snake, when people looked upon the snake, it represented Jesus taking the lies and the results of those lies upon himself. So he stepped in the gap. And now we have a choice to make. Either I can go back under the old covenant law and I can try to perform everything myself. I can try to do everything perfectly. I can try to know everything for myself, or I can just trust the one who knows everything. And I can believe that he paid the full price for my sins today. And I do that by looking at him the same way that they looked at this serpent on this pole and they lived. You know, Jesus promised us living water through his Holy Spirit. He promised us the bread of life, right? The daily bread that we need to sustain us, which he is the bread that came down from heaven. Speaking of better manna, but many of us are not eating of that bread. We're not drinking the water of life that we need because we're looking past it and we're looking to something else. And we've taken our eyes off the one who knows because we want to know. Adam and Eve had a choice. Either they could trust the one who knew or they could find out for themselves. And they found out the hard way. We don't have to find out everything for ourselves. We've got to trust the one who knows. Hebrews 12, one through three says this. It says, therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us. 
and let's run with endurance the race that is set before us. So he's saying, let's focus on the race, what God has asked us to do. And he's saying, don't fall into sin, but also don't get caught up on the obstacles. There's sin, but there's also other hindrances. And what are those? Those are the distractions. Those are when we feel like we have to take a burden upon our own shoulders that God never placed there. Or we give ourselves a calling that God never gave us. Or we try to set ourselves in place of God in one area or another. By knowing enough, by doing enough, by becoming the judge, when God was really meant to be the judge. All these things distract us from the race that God has set before us. Look at this. What does it say in verse 2? It says, looking only at Jesus. This is the answer. Looking only at Jesus. Don't look at those other things. Look at him. The originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Many people in the church are growing weary and losing heart because they're not considering the one who endured the cross. We're not looking up with that pole, and we're wondering why we have a hard time finding life on a daily basis, or we're looking for something else. We're looking at the promises instead of the promise giver, the blessings instead of the blessing giver, or we're looking at the mistakes of those in the church instead of looking at what God has done through them despite their flaws. The word says the promises of God are yes and amen through Christ Jesus. When we're in Jesus, we get the promises. They're just benefits of knowing God, Psalms 103. They are the benefits of knowing him, walking with him. How do we remain in him? The word says, therefore, as you have received Christ, so walk in him. We remain in him by doing the same thing we did at the beginning. We looked at that cross and we believed. And the joy of the Lord filled our hearts. And we said, wow, God loved me so much that Jesus came to the earth as a man and as the son of God. And he died taking the punishment for my sins upon himself. That message will bring you joy every single day if you'll learn to sit there and to look, to listen, to wait. It's a message of life. See, Adam and Eve picked fruit from the wrong tree. And then thousands of years later, Jesus died on another tree so that he could reverse the curse that had been caused by that decision. Instead of just making it vanish, it had to go through him. And it was with his own life that he redeemed us. This is what Jesus did then, and it's what he's still doing today. That redemption is still available. And I just hear the Lord's calling out to many people who you go to church or you follow the Lord, but you feel trapped in what seems like an endless cycle. And I just sense the Lord saying like many people are trapped looking at things that are either hurting them or their sinful habits or they're distracting them, but they're, they're trapped looking at things but then they try to get up and they try to do better. They feel like they can't get out of this trap, this cycle of falling right back into the same place again, and then trying to get up and do better and falling right back into the same place. And I'm just reminded of the Apostle Paul who said, you know, I've done more than everybody else, but it's not me, it's the grace of God working through me. And I just sense the Holy Spirit saying that that's the answer today, is that if you feel like you're trapped in a cycle, the only way out is through relying on the grace of God. And right at that moment of failure, or that moment of compromise, whatever it may be, the Lord is saying transparency, <laughs> be transparent. I hear the Lord saying, run to me in that moment and rely on my grace. I hear the Lord saying, believe that I am as good as I say I am. Stop relying on your faithfulness because your faithfulness keeps you bound in a circle because you're not faithful enough. But I hear the Lord saying, rely on my faithfulness today. What Jesus did for you, that will set you free. The word says, then you will Know the truth and the truth shall set you free. What is the truth? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The word says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. You don't have to rely on your faithfulness to get to God today, to get out of the cycle. You get to rely on the Son, on what He has done. You get to be made new. And listen, even when you make a mistake or you mess up, the grace of God pulls you up out of that. And it gives you a solid rock to stand on so that next time you don't have to fall into the same pit. You don't have to stay in the same place. True repentance, meaning t really turning away from something, you know, and not doing it anymore. True repentance doesn't look like holding everything together in your life and keeping it together. True repentance looks like holding on to Jesus, holding on to the cross and what he did, making that the only way of escape, because it is. That's when true repentance happens. That's when true freedom happens. True life comes in. So I hope that this message has been encouraging. I love you all so much. I'll see you next time.